Hey y'all, Freeze Cracked here. Good morning. Hey, um, I was gonna, I keep reading stuff online and people send me messages asking me about stuff and different stuff and I, I was gonna talk about working a big turtle, but um, then I got to thinking about, well, talking about tool choice and and there's been a bunch of talk online lately about indirect percussion. I'd like to say a few more things about indirect percussion. But um, I got to thinking, I still see a lot of uh, postings and talk that kind of tell me that people don't understand energy transfer and crack initiation and what it, and what, and the cracks running and staying together and stuff and the flakes staying together. and. And just want to talk about that stuff a little bit. Um, one of the things that I was going to say, this is actually a visual prop because I don't want to embarrass myself by spalling it with, in front of y'all because I haven't uh, spalled a whole bunch of stuff and I'm likely to screw it up. Um, but having said that, let me get... I don't have a huge hammer stone and this isn't a very hard hammer stone. I'm not even sure I can take a flake off this beast with this thing. Yeah, I did. Um, so there's a, a spall. And I'm stopping at this because I can't do any better than that. And and uh, so now that I've impressed you, I'm quitting. But anyway, um, the point to know about, about that is The reason that I chose this tool to do that particular task is that this is the biggest rock I had that isn't flint, um, and it's a sandstone, and it's not super hard, so it's not like granite or anything. It doesn't have a shattering effect, per se, on, on chert. That's a very tough piece of, uh, this is a very tough piece of Central Texas material. Um, so anyway, uh, if I had used any smaller rock, I would have had no effect, basically. Uh, if I'd used a harder rock, I might have set up some incipient fracture cones inside the thing that would mess it up uh, on the workpiece, but I might, uh, it, it has a shattering effect. When you're trying to make spalls, you don't, you don't want them to break. You, your flake is the product. It's not a way to get to the product. So you want them to stay together. Well, if you deliver big insurmountable energy that is going to take the flake because it's so much energy that the flake has to go, but it bonks it off instead of smashing it off, then you can get a whole flake. And that's, it, that's relevant to you when you're napping small stuff too because, um, let's face it, if the flake stays together, when you're working a small stuff. If you need a flake to run a long ways, if it stays together, it's more likely to get to the destination than if it shatters out near the front and hinges out and loses the energy. Um, so one of the things that's a big deal is the delivery of the force. And um, there's all kinds of different ways to get there. Like for instance, I could have hit that other rock with this. It's a spalling hammer and it's a fairly heavy spalling hammer. And so I think that, now I think it's kind of minimal he minimal heavy for a huge rock. This would be good for a much larger piece of obsidian or dacite. <clears throat> but some of the spalling that occurs with that stuff is using like 30 pound big things like Emery Coons uses, where it's, it's very slow, but it's just insurmountable force and that flake has to go. Um, So one of the major things that a lot of nappers don't think about is, do you want to use small force at high speed? Do you want to use huge force at almost no speed or somewhere along a continuum in the range between the two? And the answer is not, well, it doesn't matter because <laughs> trust me, it does matter. It matters based on <coughs> what your goal is and what the rock needs. All rocks are not the same. If you're hitting the heavy rocks, the, 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 the hard stones, the granular crap, the well cemented crap, like it, like the guys, a lot of the guys in Northeast are hitting, you need slow and big power. 
and sometimes they'll be hitting it with something like this. They'll they'll uh, they'll actually step well or bigger step up to something that has quite a bit of elasticity or compressive uh, nature to it, where it stores the energy, but then it has enough mass that it still puts it into the workpiece in such a high amount that the workpiece initiates the crack. Um, <clears throat> this is a smaller copper hammer I got recently. Um, it doesn't have anywhere near the ability to take a flake that some of the bigger tools have, but it's fine for its own purpose. And that's the thing is like, there are people who like, they only have like one or two tools, which I kind of think that's cool in a way too. I mean, it, it when you limit yourself, it's just like nap and abo and stuff like that. When you limit yourself to certain techniques or certain tools, you increase the interest level of the game sometimes by making it more challenging, more of a challenging puzzle. Um, but if what you're just interested in is results, that's kind of where I'm getting at with some of this stuff where I'm talking about now. Because like for instance, a lot of the people that are using indirect are not using it for the same reason I am, kind of. Um, a lot of people that are using indirect are using it as a better mousetrap, a more accurate tool, a tool that they can control better and it certainly is all that, but it also is a tool that can deliver greater force, etc. Um, so, I'm beating around the bush here. One of the things that I haven't talked much about is big indirect. I'm still using my experimental big indirect thing. I need to get a big one made. But I think once you go larger on the indirect that, you know, it makes sense to hit the rod instead of the holder. Um, and there's a big difference there for a number of reasons. One, first of all, one of the things nobody I've heard talk about is vibration on your punches. If you take an ishy stick, a full length ishy stick, and put it behind your knee or something like that, like this, and hit it, you're not gonna get a good result. The reason you're not gonna get a good result is when you hit on the end, the whole thing vibrates and the vibration of the back end attenuates the, vi the, the movement of the front end and it, and it negates it, it nullifies it fairly quickly. And uh, if you've ever played baseball and you accidentally hit way out on the end of the bat with a ball, what happens? Well, it stings the crap out of your hand and the ball doesn't go very far. Um, so the, the vibration along your tool matters dramatically. And on indirect percussion, what I think people should be doing is, you know, number one, use the shortest punch that is effective for you and granted it's a little bit harder to balance it but you don't want a big tail on the end of your punch hanging off there if you don't believe me try this technique if you want to play with abo stuff take take an antler a deer antler take two deer antlers and cut all the tines off the beam on one and then leave all the tines on the beam on the other and try and use those as punches and see what happens uh, what you'll find is that the that the the beam that's just by itself, you put that under your leg or something, put it on something, hit it, it'll work fine. But if you like tie the tie the thing on your leg or whatever with all those antler tines hanging off of it, when you hit it, it almost doesn't do nothing because those tines are just attenuating all the force from the other end. It just cancels it out a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. At any rate, um, so one of the tricks. On the uh, on the indirect, in in my opinion, is always hit right at the uh, the indirect. The positioning of the indirect. I don't even have some great platforms here. The position of the indirect. You know that makes you accurate, and the advantage too of it over a big copper billet like this. It's not just the accuracy, it's also the contact point on the platform. When you spread out your contact area over a large area, like if you have a continuous platform and you hit it with a big wide billet and catch a bunch of it at once, there's a number of things that are occurring there. 
Number one, you've lowered all your pounds per square inch because you have a larger surface area to percussor. So it isn't going to initiate the flake as suddenly. But number two, when you get all that engagement, any, any portion of your force vector that's downward is putting bending forces over a much larger area and for a longer time because the crack doesn't initiate as fast. So when you put bending forces downward on your preform over a larger area for a longer period of time, you're much more likely to have a failure. Um, one of the things that's cool about indirect is you don't actually have to support it underneath as much, and you don't have to support the back edge as much. I do, you, you know, it's good to do it anyway, but a cool thing about it is it can, if, you're, if, you're, if your workpiece will stand up to it, Indirect is powerful enough and blows the flakes fast enough and initiates the cracks fast enough that support is less relevant. It's still relevant. I'm not suggesting don't support your work. See, I'm not supporting it very well there and I've got a real steep platform and it isn't going. Part of it was the steepness of the platform though. Um, but at any rate, <clears throat> always hit it as close as you can to the workpiece. And on the shorter punches where I'm using the quarter inch punch, this, well, obviously I'm not going to hit on that because, you know, you just bend it all up or whatever, so I hit up here. But there is a big difference because when I hit here, this has a lot more compressive uh, ability than this does, so the if I use the same percussor on both of them, the speed uh, of the force delivery is going to be higher when I'm hitting on the solid copper than when I'm hitting on, on this. So depending upon what you want to use as your percussor, like for instance, if you want to use a hard percussor like, like this, well, then it would make sense probably to, if you, even if you're using big stuff, if you want to use a hard percussor, it would make sense to wrap your punch in the Delrin or something like that to put some of the uh, compressive the time delay, if you will, in the force delivery, it's not a time delay, but the, ex the expression of the force over a longer period will work better if you use a hard percussor if you wrap your punch in a softer thing because any anywhere along the chain from the time you hit it to it going into the rock, you can put your, your dwell time or your, or your extension of time or uh, this force delivery into any of this. So you can use a percussor that has compression a punch that has compression, um, I mean a punch holder, the punch itself, there's different components here. So like for instance, if, you're, if, you, if you made a thing like this and put antler in it, well antler itself stores energy. So you might want to hang the antler out of it and hit the antler directly. And you could theoretically try and do that with a hammer stone, you could try doing it with copper, you could try doing it with whatever and have a harder percussor because you've already got some compressive strength built into your, your punch itself. So, you know, there's different ways to get to the same equation. But, I'm just trying to get you to experiment whichever percussor, like for instance, it makes a huge difference which of these I hit my punches with. Because there's a lot of difference in the weight. It's the same material, but if I hit a punch with this, the the impact is faster. I hit faster, and it, depending on what the material is, I may blast through the platform and not take the flake, or I might take a good flake, depending upon if the material's tough and has a lot of uh, chewiness to it, like a cel chalcedony, like a knife river flint or something like that. Then you know I may want to go faster uh, with a smaller punch or something. If on the other hand, I'm trying to hit rhyolite or I'm trying to hit a, uh, a chalky, uh, poor edge quality, poor flake tensile strength, uh, chert, raw, rough chert with a bunch of concrete in it or whatever, I may well want to go to a larger or even larger. I mean, you know, get back over to the wood. And, but again, if I'm on the other hand, I'm trying to do a big, thin blade, and I'm hitting on something that's three and a half inches wide and say half an inch thick and, you know, long, and I w I'm trying to decrease any potential error factor, 
then I'm like, well, maybe a smaller, I may, I may still feel I need to take big flakes. So I may want to use a punch that has a little bit of mass to it, but then I'll have to rethink going real slow with it. And I may want to isolate the platforms because the slower the force delivery is, if I do screw up with my angle by a tiny bit, or I don't get my support underneath the platform good or something, if I'm supporting the platform underneath, uh, you don't always do that with the punches, it's different strategies. Um, the dwell time, the downward time component and the bite on the piece is gonna amplify any bending forces if it's a longer time and a wider contact point. So I have to bear that in mind. And, and now if I want to take a big old huge flake, I may have to just be deadly accurate with my angle and get it exactly right and it'll be an inward force and there is no bend, bending forces downward. But a couple of degrees can make a big difference. And so indirect is totally different from direct in that there's a number of things that it does that are a benefit. And one of the things it does is allow you to work more effectively with greater force, less risk, and um, less support and less chance of breakage and more chance of perfection sometimes than direct does. And I love direct, so I don't even like saying this kind of stuff, but I will tell you that I've used indirect. I haven't shown much big indirect, but I've used big indirect and um, I love direct percussion, so I don't even like to talk about big indirect or anything like that. But if you're going to hand me a big rock or a big preform and a, uh, now see, I'm not even supporting it anywhere close to the pre from the platform. I've got it stuck in the back of my leg and I'm hitting it with slow force. But it still, you know, that wasn't very pretty. It still goes. And you couldn't really get away with that with uh, direct. Because with direct, the engagement surface is so much bigger that you're going to be really. Although I will say too, you know, I don't f practice what I preach. I'm still using this experimental punch and I've got some back end hanging out back there and I can tell that it affects uh, the force delivery. It attenuates it some. Well, I've made all those points. Uh, so me showing you crap doesn't necessarily, I mean, either you believe me or you don't, but I, you know, I really thought about this stuff a lot and I've used different percussors and different punch materials and everything and I was doing some work one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I was doing some work yesterday on a pretty big blade of bad material and uh, man I was just doing some things that seemed to me to be almost miraculous with the indirect see I, I grabbed it beside the platform that time and support a little bit better and drove it off um, but at any rate I'm, just, I'm rambling. How many minutes have I spent here? More than enough. Let me uh, let me come back and talk about angles a little bit. A guy asked me to talk about angles, and I want to talk about angles a little bit. And I'll come back and talk about that and some other little tool stuff and material choice stuff, and I'll be right back.